Welcome to the Money GPS. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. This is going to be huge because we're going to talk about two major factors today, okay? The first thing I want to highlight right now is Bretton Woods 3. This is so important because it's going to affect everybody. The second thing I want to talk about is what nobody is watching. I'm going to show you something that it's so simple and yet people are not touching on it. So let's get into all of that and more. Here we have Putin may collect $321 billion windfall if oil and gas keep flowing. Goldman and the IIF expect record current account surplus for Russia. Embargo on energy exports can tip economy into a deeper crisis. We are watching the price of these commodities rising considerably, although in the past few trading sessions that has come down. At the same time, we are seeing these countries like Russia that are exporters of this doing well as a result of it. Of course, you will see that happening over time when oil is at, let's say, zero dollars as it was for a very short period of time. That wasn't so good for countries like Russia. And then when it's at a hundred dollars a barrel, of course, it happens to benefit them. So this rises and falls. Now, the reason I'm covering this is because this article here, now, you know Zoltan, if not, he worked at the New York Fed, specifically at the desk. And that's where all of the operations, the open market operations are done. And that effectively is like the most important factor for what we talk about here on this channel. So Zoltan used to work there. Now he works for Credit Suisse. And essentially, he is an extremely important person and very accurate in what he has to say. He had this here. There's a lot, of course, in the article, but I wanted to touch on one thing. Commodity reserves will be an essential part of Bretton Woods 3, and historically, wars are won by those who have more food and energy supplies. He added, in the new world order, banks could create euro renminbi mainly to accumulate for buying Chinese treasuries outside money like gold and commodity reserves instead of foreign currency reserves. What's he talking about here along with all of this? I think it's important, he says it here, the price signals from the four pillars of commodity trading will dominate the signals coming from the four prices of money. If you have the time, spend it reading this article, okay? Links into the description below. What he's talking about here is that these commodity-based countries, Russia being one of them, are poised to do well in the next system. A currency does not last forever. An empire doesn't last forever, no matter how many people want to believe it. But it doesn't have to happen in an instant where there's this big war that happens like uh, you know, World War II or World War I. No, it could be very different this time around. It could be purely economic. It could be cyber. It could be anything. But right now, what we are seeing is we are going to a multipolar world where you don't have one at the top. You know, this can be a different situation where you have Russia, China, India, and some other countries in Asia that are doing more business together on their own terms. And then you have the Western countries doing business the way that they do it. Things have really, really changed. And we have seen that just over the past few years. Russia is going away from the US dollar. China, although they hold a trillion dollars in US debt, they have started to wean off of that over the last several years. So you look at all of these things, and of course, the currency swap agreements and everything else. All of this information piled on top, it shows us that we have to be concerned about what's coming. And what is that? Well, of course, higher prices, inflation, and generally the lack of savings that people have today uh, is worrisome for the future because they're so invested in their real estate, their own personal real estate, as well as investment real estate. They are over leveraged on every possible metric you can use, as well as in the stock market and other aspects too. Chicago to offer gas and public transit cards to combat the city's gas burden. So the prices go up, the government simply pumps out more money in one way or another, and that stimulus has an indirect effect that will come back and raise prices again. Hmm, interesting, right? We have this. 
pizza prices surpass subway fares, upending decades of NYC economics. So this happens to be New York, but I'm sure it's kind of similar everywhere else. And it's just a simple way of showing what has happened. But I'll tell you right now, if the prices haven't gone up yet, they're going to go up soon. Everything seems to be going up. This is the CEO of Freight Waves. Freight Waves being probably one of the best resources for information on shipping. I always use them as a resource. And according to the CEO, a freight recession is imminent. So what we are looking at here, if there's less of a demand, demand destruction, whether that's because the prices are too high or they can't, you know, the products can't be had for whatever reason, then suddenly you don't need the workers there. So things are really getting thrown around. There's no doubt about that. And that ultimately puts me into this. Now think about it for a second. What happens when food prices are too high? The truth is for some people, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's just not going to affect them. A few bucks extra, not going to impact. But there's a lot of people globally that it will impact. War in Ukraine pushes Middle East and North Africa deeper into hunger as food prices reach alarming highs. The food riots have not only already happened, but they'll start to spread around the world. I would be very concerned about this. It goes for everywhere you see. Cucumber crisis, surging energy prices leave British glass houses empty. The prices that you pay for food today, they've already increased, but the prices you pay today will seem like nothing when we look at this six months from now, a year from now, because the prices aren't going down. Steep decline in overall retail visits. This tells us that there has been a big change. When you look at what's happening with retail stores and what they are dealing with, then you have a concern. And by the way, I'm talking about all of this. We're like seven, eight minutes into this. And I still haven't got to that one thing because I'm leading up into that. Stick with me. If you appreciate the information, hit that thumbs up button. Hit it thrice. Hit it. Don't hit it twice because that's going to unclick it. Hit it thrice. Okay. Okay. All right, but looking at this, overall retail weekly visits year over three year comparison. And all they just wanted to show you here was that this has been declining, showing that people are saying, you know what, I'm not going to drive there. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to move there because things are just too expensive. So we can see the hesitation, um, you know, on the part of the consumer. This is um, something else that connects in with that. Goldman Sachs is tracking ID swipes so it can crack down on employees who are breaking its return to the office rules. You know, there's the one aspect here about the, what the company's doing. Look, all companies, financial companies at least, do this. They track where their employees are coming from based on their ID swipes. Uh, so it's nothing new. But what it does tell you is that there is a push to get at least the financial establishments back to the office to some degree. And that would, of course, bring back the life to the downtown core, to these big office towers, and so on. And of course, when you look at the commercial mortgage-backed securities, let me tell you, they need it. So let's look at the what I believe is, is so important, so integral right now to understand what's happening and yet it's not being covered. Length of time from the start of a Fed hiking cycle to the 210 inversion. This is the yield curve inversion. I'll look at that more in a second here. Real quick explanation. When we look at these longer dated bonds, we should be getting a higher yield than we would for a shorter dated bond, right? The longer it is, the more risk there is. But now that has inverted and this happens time and time again, right before a recession. So people will say, you know what? It takes two years. It takes two years for this to happen. So why do I care? It's going to be so long from now. But there's something else. You see, the length of the time from the start of the Fed hiking cycle to that inversion, typically 23 months. But in this case, it was two weeks. Not two years, it was two weeks. So think about that for a second now. We accelerate the general cycle by potentially two years. So we're bringing that upward. 
We don't know what that means. We know how long it was supposed to be, all that. We don't know. But it just tells us that the timeline has been brought inward. To me, this is massive. It speaks for itself. I don't need to rant on about it. But please, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you appreciate it, again, hit that thumbs up. Look at this. This is the ISM manufacturing. And I've been covering this all along. I'm going to show you this all the time. And look what has happened here. This has been declining on average, month after month after month after month. It's going down. Part of the reason here is obviously prices. Okay, that's prices right here, showing us that they have gone up considerably. There are many factors, there are more, more reasons for that, of course. This is showing us the ISM manufacturing just broken down. And you could look at that if, if you're interested in it, just to see what it's all made up of, new orders, production, employment, inventories, and so on. Okay, regardless, it's moving downward. And by the way, once it gets to, if I show you this right here, the level of 50, just under where that red dotted line is, that would be a contraction. Okay, so we're almost there right now, contraction. So we'll see what happens. I'll give you the updates. Diamonds are a woman's best friend. Is that the line? Something like that anyway. They've been increasing. Okay. Month after month, since March 2020, this has been, quite frankly, a good investment. There's no doubt about that. It was below 110, hard to tell exactly, let's say 108, 109, and is now 140 on the index. We will see what happens with that. But you know that real assets generally preserve wealth over long periods of time and sometimes are not correlated with a lot of other assets, like art. Okay, you, you just see art prices are just ridiculous at some points, and you know they're just in a different world. If somebody's buying a $30 million painting, that person doesn't exist in the same reality as you and I. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's not somebody that's, you know, got the nice BMW down the street. It's a completely different world. S&P 500 performance by sector since the 2020 lows. Look at it, energy by far. This is why I think it's a very big concern when I see the YouTubers and all those others out there who basically just tell you the same thing they were telling you right from March, like before 2020 and right through 2020, even into this year. Just the same mantra over and over and over again. Buy Tesla, buy Tesla, buy Tesla. Yeah, we get it, okay? But if you had been looking at the trends here, commodities were clearly on the up through that period. So you could have been loading up on that through this period instead of just, I'm just going to buy the same thing over and over again. I mean, you, nobody told you to sell anything, but just anyway, this is just a yield curve inversion, just showing you more and more of these are inverting. And it is, of course, a very good and accurate indicator. This is showing us the commodity index for Bloomberg that over the past few trading sessions has definitely come down quite a bit. I think I have oil. Oil at the time of this recording is under $100 a barrel. That is pretty big. And of course, the ruble has erased all its losses uh, throughout this period. So things are certainly changing. And I wanted to bring up this because I think it is extremely clear to me. This is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet since 1914. Uh, while the Federal Reserve Act was from 1913, technically they started the operations uh, in, in 20, uh, excuse me, 1914. Did I say 2013? Only a hundred year difference. Um, looking at this here, it just shows us the, the Fed balance sheet as a percentage of the GDP. So every time they run into a crisis, they do in fact Look at it. Look at it for yourself. Hey, people think that the Federal Reserve just started pumping out money as of 2008. That is not the case. They do it every single crisis. They've been intervening in the markets every single crisis. This time is different, though. Whatever. Anyway, looking at this, it just shows us as a percentage of the GDP, it gets bigger every single time. And of course, they will eventually own it all. That's what their intention is. This is just showing us that if you desire, if you want, if you've got $300,000 to spare, well, then Dolce Gabbana is willing to sell you a tiara that you can wear in the metaverse. If you've got $300,000, hey, why not, right? <laughs>
maybe I'm maybe I'm getting old. I got a few too many gray hairs, but I just don't understand it. That's just me. All right. I'd rather own three hundred thousand dollars worth of real estate. Okay, that's just me, and not in the metaverse, in the real world. That's just the way it is. But you tell me what you think. I'm going to end it there. If you appreciate the information, hit that thumbs up button and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.